on credit and economic stimulus measures was showing signs of fatigue. In response, Chinese authorities initiated an economic rebalancing process emphasizing private consumption over investment, internal over external demand, and services over industry. This shift came at the cost of sacrificing some-term growth for the sake of more sustainable long-term trajectory, trying to avoid the middle income trap. Effectively managing this transformation requires a comprehensive structural reform program. I'm announcing the role of the private sector in economic decision making. However, this has to be implemented with the framework of China's economic structure and institutional practices, which retain many aspects of centralized planning. The policies put in place and the resulting economic dynamics did lead to some degree of economic rebalancing in China. Coupled with the impact of the COVID-19 crisis and challenging global conditions, this resulted in a significant deceleration of economic activity. As a result, the GDP growth gradually declining during the last decade, falling from nearly 10% in 2010 to approximately 5% in 2023, according to the latest IMF forecast. In recent months, the limitation of the growth model have become more evident. Both investment and consumption has shown clear signs of exhaustion at the rivers of growth. Furthermore, exports has been hampered by a combination of weak global demand and geopolitical tensions. The economic environment uncertainty has been compounded by the challenge in the real estate sector, which appear to be escalating. In the face of more rapid deterioration in economic activity than expected, the Chinese authorities have responded with target, targeted stimulus policies. However, the room for maneuvers seems to be diminishing. Um, this transformation of the China's growth model also presents several medium-term economic challenges, including aging population, diminishing returns on capital, high and rising debt levels, environmental concerns, and worries about the income inequality. Managing these challenges while sustaining growth is a critical aspect of China's economic outlook, as we will explore today. Given China's importance in the global economy, his, its global growth model transformation will have, uh, will have uh, significant repercussions globally. The weakening of Chinese economic growth will impact, uh, will impact the rest of the world through various channels, both directly through international trade and commodity demand, and indirectly through the heightening society and decline in global confidence potentially leading to risk aversion in international markets. This transformation also has a substantial geopolitical implications. This panel discussion provides us uh, with a valuable opportunity to gain deeper understanding of China's growth model, the forces driving its rapid expansion, its limitations, and its potential implications for the global economy's future. Through our conversation, we will explore a wide range of topics from government policies and the role of the state in the financial sector to the challenges of transforming, of transforming the investment and export-led growth model and the, and the demographic underlying constraints. I, I encourage all of you to actively participate in this dialogue by asking questions and sharing your insights. Our goal is to foster a comprehensive and enlightened discussion. With that, I would like to invite to our esteemed panelist, Professor Rogoff, to share his, his work and set the stage for what promised to be a captivating and informative discussion. Thank you for joining us, and let us to embark in an exploration of rethinking China's growth. Uh, thank you, Daniel. I'm wondering if someone can put the slides up on the screen. There it is. I feel like I'm at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why don't I start speaking and maybe we can sort this out. Um, anyway, it's a, a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I greatly appreciate this invitation uh, to speak to the CEPR uh, Economic Policy Group and to Roberto and Isabel, Maritz and Philippe uh, for this opportunity. Um, people have asked me, have I been to the Banco de España before? And, uh, I know I've been a handful of times, but one time I particularly remember is in 1997, I presented a paper. Uh, I presented a paper to this group uh, that uh, I, you know, I still, still quite a memorable uh, experience that was about the euro and large denomination euro notes. 
I, I also uh, need to say at the outset of this, um, I've been working on this topic uh, for uh, really five years now with uh, Yuan Chen Yang, who's uh, I've been a co-author uh, of a couple of papers before this, and this is a third paper. However, um, the views here are only mine. They are not the views of the International Monetary Fund. When I met Yuan Chen, uh, she was um, a student at Tsinghua uh, visiting Harvard Business School, but now she's a, a uh, uh, economist at the International Monetary Fund. And uh, uh, I'd also say uh, I, we're very excited about the written paper that accompanies uh, my talk along with the others I'm going to speak about, but that paper in particular had to have IMF clearance uh, enough set. Um, so uh, I'll actually uh, start with saying I've been often get asked over the years, <clears throat> can I think of another is at this time different example, uh, uh, you know, referring to my 2009 book with Carmen Reinhardt. And for years, you know, many years, I've almost invariably said China, because these things happen where you don't think they're going to happen. You run into problems in the places that uh, seem to be doing great and everybody thinks are go going to be doing great. I don't want to overstate this. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to qualifications to that view. Um, I actually was invited to present this, this, this view before I'd done these papers to the China Development Forum. I don't know if any of you know what that is, but it's uh, uh, this very important forum held uh, right after the uh, party has released its policies for the year. Uh, and it's generally attended by a very small number of academics, but mostly the leaders of finance and business and tech uh, come from around the world because they get to speak to the Chinese leadership uh, which I guess they have a lot of things to say. Uh, I got to speak in the opening plenary to everyone in this bigger room than I've ever seen. Uh, and I figured, well, you know, you only live once. Maybe they actually want to know what I think. Uh, and so I really gave, uh, you know, arguments why it was going to be very challenging to uh, stay at the high levels of growth that they'd had in the past. And, uh, I have some, my written remarks are online. Um, I think my spoken remarks were even more blunt. Um, I said, you know, pointed to demographics, the slowing rate of productivity growth. Uh, I talked about the diminishing returns to investment in general. Uh, I added uh, my understanding, as Daniel has said, is that you want to transition to a more consumer-led society. I'm not quite sure how this goes along with the centralization of power uh, that I see going on in the economic sphere. Um, afterwards, I was a little nervous what they would say to me, but uh, they said, we really appreciated your comments, Professor Rogoff. I was glad to be allowed to leave the country still uh, after saying that. But uh, no, I mean, they were, they were uh, you know, were, uh, you know, absorbed the points, I think. I, of course, today, we'd have to add to that deglobalization, uh, geo, uh, geopolitical frictions, which are important. Well, uh, until I met Yuan Chen Yang, um, I really didn't have an anchor for saying something concrete about the Shang Zhen, who's one of the other discussants here, has really written a lot uh, about uh, China using uh, very rich data sets there. Uh, but I didn't know how to sort of sink my teeth into it. And uh, uh, fortunately, um, she had been uh, working at the St uh, Chinese Statistical Bureau for a few years before I'm going to graduate school and was aware of some of the new data that was coming online. We exploit in this work, um, there's uh, data that's been digitized for cities and provinces that, uh, that hadn't existed before. And so... Uh, our, our first paper that we wrote was in 2020, an NBR paper, was called Peak China Housing. I don't know if we coined the term Peak China, um, but it, it comes up quite a bit now. It's become quite common. And uh, there, there had, it was, it was um, there, 
there hadn't been a paper on uh, so many papers on Chinese housing, believe it or not. Uh, when we wrote that paper, there had been a few, but uh, by and large, it had been a few years. There was a, a notable paper by uh, my colleagues, uh, Ed Glazer, Andre Schleifer, and uh, uh, a couple others that was in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that you know, certainly had a flavor of some of the facts that I'm talking about, but their data was only through 2011. Uh, things moved very fast in China, and it concentrated on the largest uh, uh, cities. So, um, and, and I would also say overwhelmingly, even going to some other papers that were written after, the general consensus was, wow, this is growing really fast and the prices are going up, but it's going to be manageable. That was just you know, overwhelmingly, I would say, what the literature said. I'm not, obviously, there were some, I don't want to quite use the word crackpots, but, you know, people who uh, had a investment thesis who would say something, you know, very controversial, but not particularly anchored in anything. So one thing we did was using what everyone else is doing now in macro, look at the size of the real estate uh, sector using uh, just an input-output table, the Chinese input-out table. The table. We were not the first to do this. Uh, there was a paper done at the Kansas City Fed, uh, like you know, ten years earlier, uh, which had done this. But it, you know, it certainly you get the point, and I'll, I'll compare it with other countries a little bit. That uh, when you look at the direct and indirect impact of the real estate sector, uh, it's pretty large. So. 23% if you don't count imported content, 26% if you do. And I'll give you some reasons you would want to think about both. Um, this number, which I will compare, uh, just in real estate, exceeds Spain and Ireland at their pre-crisis peaks, just to put that in uh, perspective. Um, another thing we did, which maybe almost was more important, was we started putting together numbers, and there's us. Uh, we took, I think, advanced it uh, some in this paper about China's housing stock, not just the rate it's building, not just employment, but how much is there. And uh, something that sort of surprised us was that China's per capita housing stock had already then reached levels similar to many wealthier European countries. Uh, I'll come to it in a second, but it's very hard to compare incomes across countries, across time. You all know that. But I think by any comparison, if you take the, the, the entirety of China, it's vastly less wealthy than Europe. It's probably per capita income, probably a quarter of the United States at best. If you use market prices, you get a lower number than that. So the fact that so much housing had been built, most of it pretty new. Was significant. So, you know, some people say, well, it, it, people have been worrying about China's building a lot of houses, prices are going up for a long time. Why should it be a problem now? And the answer is that at some point you run into diminishing returns. And that was a, a central point of ours. And uh, obviously, we've seen that in other fast growing countries. Uh, everyone here is too young, but I'm not. The Soviet Union. Uh, absolutely ran into this problem. When I was an undergraduate at uh, Yale, we used Samuelson's book, which you can go look it up for a very long time, predicted the Soviet Union would equal the United States uh, in per capita GDP. And he gave a range in the year I took it from 85 to 97. I, I took it in 1972. Um, and uh, he kept that for a long time. And he was just... He, he was, to be fair to him, he was probably just using it as an example of how important compounding is. And I, but he he had a he had like a box on this that that he kept. Uh, then uh, there's uh, you know other uh, examples of countries that slow down. Japan, famously, the bridges to nowhere. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, and, oh, you can go across Asia and find similar things with diminishing return set. And frankly, I think a reevaluation of what's happened in Europe, why has Europe fallen behind so much the past couple decades when it seemed to be catching up also speaks to this issue that there was a lot of catching up, some of it building infrastructure. And so um, 
we we don't i you know i'm just going to say already we when when we were writing these i mean it's unfolded that china at the moment is slowing down it's not easy to have evidence that's decisive about this partly because it, the the data is not so great that you have is available from china it's not there there are lots of reasons for this i won't get into it here um we do and i think it's a central part of our this paper uh is we're able to put together uh, pretty good data on per capita housing looking uh, city by city. And uh, you won't find vacancy data city by city. There was a Princeton study in uh, uh, 2007, published in 2017, giving a bit of vacancy data. That's now a national secret, basically, in China. The price data is they give us a joke. Um, I mean, it's bad and everywhere. It's very hard to do price data, but it's, you know, I, I was reading, there was just an article in today's uh, Bloomberg. Prices in China seem to have fallen a quarter percent, you know, over the last month. And I, I think the way to read that, if they're willing to say it fell a quarter percent, it probably fell a lot more than that. So there are a lot of things we don't know. So a lot of things in here is, is, uh, is speculative. Um, coming back to the broader issue, which Daniel introduced, uh, there are many problems simultaneously going on. Uh, real estate is very often at the center of dramatic slowdowns. It's not unusual. And there, I'm going to talk, I, I'm going to introduce infrastructure in this paper also. And it's, it's not unusual. We don't know. Um, and certainly there are reasons China could be different. Uh, and you have to have humility. Uh, the Chinese authorities have just outperformed. And if you look at the difference between how they've done and forecasts, for years, it's like always better than the forecast, at least the official data. Um, so I've already mentioned this, but um, a, a, if you add infrastructure to the mix, you get uh, real estate plus infrastructure, again, including a, a few percent imported is 31% of China's GDP. Uh, and uh, one thing uh, that's sort of we, a reaction we got from our first paper was, well, uh, we're, we live at, you know, we're looking at Shenzhen and Shanghai and Guangzhou. Prices are soaring in those places. What are you talking about that there's any kind of slowdown or any kind of concern? And as we'll see, it's a very it very much depends on where you are, whether there's a problem or not. Uh, it's slowed down in the big cities dramatically, maybe to nothing, even on the official data now. But in tier three cities, even on the tier, I'll talk about the tier system in a, a moment, but the tier three cities are the smaller and poorer countries, uh, which are uh, poor, smaller and poorer cities, which are nevertheless important. On the tier three cities, everything's much more uh, dramatic. The idea that the real estate problem would be in the tier three cities, but not so much everywhere, is also familiar from real estate problems that we've seen. So I know the United States well. Uh, the real estate problem was really in four states. It was in Nevada, California. I mean, California is 20% of GDP, but it was in Nevada, California, Florida, uh, and Arizona. And it wasn't universal. And I really don't know Spain, but I'm guessing if you looked at the coast of Spain, it was way worse where there was the buildup of vacation housing. And one can say the same thing about Ireland. Uh, another thing we take up is the extent to which real estates contributed to financial vulnerability of local governments. I don't think this is a terribly original point. It complements the other things we're saying. Uh, uh, that's certainly been a concern that uh, uh, certainly the IMF uh, has had reports on this. And uh, everyone's aware that uh, part of how China had maintained technocratic excellence for so long, and it, and it has, was by sort of having a tournament where if you grew really fast in your city, you get promoted. And there was just no way better to grow really fast than to build a lot of infrastructure and uh, and real estate so we'll look at that also just a note on china's growth numbers and uh there's a mix of things making it hard uh to do 
I'll tell you another war story if I have time. When I first went to the IMF, uh, the, the first, it was in August 2001, and we were predicting the world would hit a recession. That was before 9-11. And uh, so we had everybody predicting a recession, but we weren't predicting China had having a recession. We weren't even predicting a slowdown. And I asked my uh, David Robinson, who was my deputy director of research, Antonio Spielenberg, who now has that role, um, uh, why, why, why aren't we having them slow down? And he said, well, the premier has just given a talk saying what their number is going to be next year. And I think that would be a good guess. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is an element of that, but it's also just very difficult to compare. So uh, here I give numbers for what the official growth rate says, and this is also what's in the IMF uh, World Economic Outlook tables. And the Penn World tables, which try to put everything into U.S. prices, give a lower rate of growth. There, you, you know, some of you have done growth theory and know much more about this, and more recently they're the Groningen tables, and they're all interesting, but it's it's not easy to make these comparisons. The recent numbers, we don't have the Penn World tables for more recently, but if you use the official numbers for 2020 through 2024, and now I'm really just using last week's World Economic Outlook, it gives, uh, correct me, Antonio, if I'm wrong, but it gives 4.4% uh, is what the forecast is. So there's a question of what it will be going forward. I can't you know, said so it's going to be 2% and 3%. I think it's hard to compare the numbers. So it depends on what number you're talking about. I, I would say that uh, China's likely hit, you know, uh, a, tur a turning point where uh, it may have cycles, but the, you know, projection I would give is going to have a much slower growth rate over the next decade than it did over the past. And I think the problem that's most intractable is real estate, where if you read, you know, what some people say, oh, they tightened up on restrictions on lending, and if they loosen them, it'll be fine. I don't think so. I think the problems are much uh, deeper uh, seated, seated than that. Okay, this is a familiar kind of graph, and uh, uh, Glazer and Schleifer had a version of it from earlier where you see the you know uh, five-fold growth rate in red are the tier one cities. Uh, the tier two cities have grown less, but still a ton. Uh, and the tier three cities, uh, which are in uh, purple, if you're seeing that on your screen, uh, grow a lot more slowly. But there's just this spectacular uh, growth. I just want to say a word about the. Um, uh, you know, the estimates of uh, China's housing sector activity. This is from our earlier paper, which gives it at 26% of GDP. Um, so I'm just going to advance forward to this. When you, when you add infrastructure, uh, you get this larger number. Okay, there are all sorts of qualifications to using input-output having to do with the dynamics and such, and I recognize that. Um, uh, we'll come back to talking more about that later, but and we'll look at comparable numbers for other countries. Um, also, the data we have is that construction and uh, real estate employment is a large part of urban employment. It's a, also a big part of the economy. So this compares China to other countries and using, this is new, uh, and using, uh, using a similar input-output Going to each uh, going to each country, and uh, you see that uh, China is very high today compared to where Spain was and uh, Ireland was at their peaks. Uh, the the number you get when you add uh, infrastructure plus real estate for the U.S. is nineteen percent. If you uh, just do our the, our infrastructure spending is much smaller, so if you do just real estate, you get a number more like fifteen percent. So you know, just put the China number in that perspective; it's not completely off the charts. There was uh, an article in the Economist commenting on our first paper, uh, critiquing it really based on work from the Asian Development Bank, which first said the true numbers are half as large. I would say they've since corrected their numbers to 
uh, look a lot more like ours. But they would maintain that uh, if you look at India, you look at other developing economies, you still get pretty big numbers for these calculations. And I have no reason to presume that's not true. I think the difference in China is it's been going on for a long time, not just a few years. And that's where the diminishing returns uh, set in. So here's uh, a, a new comparison of living space uh, per capita that we've done uh, constructing the numbers ourselves. Uh, so the United States is in blue at the top, China's in red. This only goes back to 2010, but with the numbers we've constructed, uh, the per capita square meters in 1991 was 4.7, and now it's 10 times that in China, what it was of housing per person. And uh, even this graph, which uh, where we have it, we have it corresponding to what we have from the other countries, only going from 2010. Uh, nevertheless, China's made up half the difference with the United States. The U.S. has been 65 square meters uh, per person. Again, be what that may. Uh, let me just mention a point that again Daniel made, uh, and this is not my graph. This is, this is not from one of our papers. This is from Iswar Prasad, 20, recent 2023 Brookings paper, where I think it must be said he gives a more, he's a very seasoned China observer and gives a more optimistic take on what the future might be. But he, uh, point, that there won't be any dramatic slowdown. Um, you can read his paper to see a more precise wording. Uh, but uh, it looks at red as credit and blue as output. And you can see that what's called the credit intensity is going up. And it sort of you know, reflects that there could be some financial issue. In our first paper, we just we mentioned it, but we said, look, simply moving that much of the economy is difficult. It's not, you don't have to have a financial crisis. I think as uh, in this paper, we talk a little bit more about the risks that there could be a financial crisis. And looking at this, it is a very credit-driven economy. So, okay, the local government financing vehicles, which I'll mention, are a problem. They have all sorts of uh, their equivalent of the shadow banking sector. That could be a problem. China, excuse me, Chinese government will pay for everything. They'll socialize everything. They'll instantly fix everything. But a lot of the reason that financial crisis caused such a problem is that it slows down credit for a long time and whether it will be possible to do that and maintain these the the credit intensity i think is unclear um, i'm running longer and i'll try to uh, not be more than another five or ten minutes I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much time i have left but i know i'm running too long uh, in in china housing wealth is a big part of wealth uh, this is a graph giving uh, giving the uh, what it is. This is in trillion Chinese uh, RMB, uh, and it goes. It separates by tier one, tier two, and tier three cities. And by comparison, at the right is the A shares in the stock markets. Wealth, housing wealth, is a big part of their wealth. Now, that has partly to do with legal restrictions, not being able to hold things abroad. Their equivalent of the SEC. Uh, has a lot more difficulties, but I'm only making the point that if housing prices become soft, it's a big factor. This isn't a little thing in uh, Chinese growth. Uh, I'm just now do a comparison with the United States and uh, and Japan, and again, you can see how important uh, housing is in China. Uh, relative to stocks and relative to bonds compared to the United States. You notice that the mark, this is taking, uh, this is the, uh, this is from an earlier paper, uh, this is taking the value of Chinese real estate at market value. Uh, uh, you note it's much greater than the value of US. I mentioned parenthetically, that was true of Japan for about a year in 1991, uh, but it's not true today. Um, so a lot of the work uh, in earlier papers focused on the tier one and maybe the tier two cities because there's a lot more data. That's not true anymore since they digitized their census and their statistical 
uh, their national uh, statistics. There's much better data. So the, the, the tier one cities are these, you know, um, marquee cities on the coast and the tier two cities are mostly provincial capitals and a few other cities like Tianjin, uh, which has a special status. I, I describe the tier three cities, no offense to my friends from Cincinnati, but it's the Cincinnati's of, uh, of China. Uh, Cincinnati's doing okay, but uh, they're not small. You can be a tier three city and have 5 million people. It's one of the remarkable things China's done is try to prevent everyone from moving to the big cities. They've done that by building a tremendous amount of infrastructure and real estate at by a very exacting national standards. I've actually had opportunity to visit some of these places uh, over the years, and it's sort of shocking. Uh, so the uh, it's not it's not that you go to Tianjin and everything's a dump. It feels a little depressing. I mean, you know, I've been there, but it's it's not because of the real estate. I mean, I think that I was at a conference in a building which literally was only used once a year for this conference uh, to give you an idea of excess capacity. Um, the tier three cities, the Cincinnati's are very important. They're 60% of China's GDP. That's a calculation uh, we offer uh, in the paper. Uh, China's been successful at resisting Ziff's law in a way that you have it in other cities. And I, you know, I, if you asked me 15 years ago, was that a good idea? I'd, I'd have probably said yes. I wonder if you would have too. You know, if you look at what happened to San Paulo and uh, Mumbai and other 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 cities, but the result is they built all this infrastructure in uh, cities. Well, price data we only have through uh, 2021, and actually uh, we've done our own calculation of what it's going on in tier three cities using our housing uh, stock data. And so the, the green line and the red line are officially published. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've jumped ahead of myself. This is the share of investment. Let me uh, skip on. The uh, tier three cities have a huge percentage of the physical housing stock. That's not by value, but it's still 50%. That's a number that fluctuates because the markets uh, fluctuates. Yeah. If you look at new road construction, this is from 2012 to 2020. It's the green is the tier three, the percent in the tier three cities. If you look at sewage, it's the same. If you look at high speed railways, China is continuing to build high speed railways much faster in terms of uh, the uh, size of the network than passenger miles are growing. We have a chart in the paper, and I, we don't say it in the paper, but I'm saying it here. I mean, China will be. Japan was known for building bridges to nowhere. Ch China will be known for having built high-speed railways to nowhere. Um, how, we do have some data on housing prices. This is what I was jumping ahead and confusing myself. The uh, blue and the orange line are official data. The green line is a calculation we've done using national data and using the, uh, the official data showing that uh, prices have fallen even by the official data. Another measure we do have of vacancies are how much unfinished housing there is relative to, um, uh, so how much housing is under construction relative to housing completed. And normally I think of building a house as taking a couple of years, maybe it's faster in China. Um, if I can permit another second to say, have an aside, uh, there was sort of a joke going around a couple of years ago when the Second Avenue subway was taking forever to build in New York, and uh, it took ten years and was supposed to take you know a lot less. And some Chinese tourists came and they were looking, and the uh, the tour guide was very, saying very proudly, "This is going to be done in two years." And the Chinese spoke among themselves. The interpreter came back and said, "We just want to be sure. you met two months, right?" And I was, so two years is the U.S. standard for this. And so this is, a, you know, the ratio has gone up to 10.6 in tier three cities. It also suggests uh, that there's a vacancy problem. And you see the same thing in commercial real estate. This is another uh, chart from the paper. Um, let me speak about uh, land finance, uh, where uh, 
selling and reselling land has been a business model for the Chinese cities because they're responsible for providing education and um, uh, health, but they've had a lot of their sources of revenue taken away. They're allowed to have uh, all kinds of uh, fees, but uh, the, the, it's, this is actually discussed in Kei uh, Zhen has a very recent book about China, and she discusses how as part of the anti-corruption campaign, the central government took away uh, their ability to collect property taxes and other direct taxes, and they let them sell and resell land. A lot of this is done through these local government vehicles. And this is the official number. We're taking it, the, uh, an IMF number here of how big the local government debt is. But it's, let's just say it might be a much, a much uh, larger number. I need to conclude, but I'll just say, um, uh, a, a couple more things that uh, we in uh, the last couple we use this data set to try to break down uh, whether uh, real estate investment has contributed to growth and whether it's slowed down uh, growth and also whether it's contributed here I I just don't have time I, I haven't left myself time to uh, talk about it um, I just want to come back to one final. Uh, figure. So uh, a leading authority on China wrote to me saying, hmm, I see you're saying that they have a problem with real estate. What about the fact that the steel industry grew 6.6% through July? And steel is a very major input into construction. Uh, uh, I don't know the numbers in China. It's very large in the United States. And okay, part of our answer to that is we didn't say the building slowed down yet. It, the numbers I just saw again today were that it's slowed down a couple percent now, a, a couple percent of GDP. Our, our numbers has it, have it, has it coming down 1% between 20 and 2021. Uh, but there are other things that steel is used for. It's uh, uh, mentioned here. So in, uh, you know, in conclusion, uh, there's this... Uh, famous uh, thing in Japan of people saying that interest rates have to go up and they never do. And it's called the widow maker trade, you know, saying that it has to go up and they don't. And maybe the same thing's true of China and the still many people who say that uh, the government's, you know, just going to find other things to do like green energy, their solutions to all these problems. And there are. But I think if you look at other countries that have run into very similar issues like this, it's hard to think of any except maybe Singapore that's navigated this, where Singapore just, it's a tiny country, reinvents itself every two years and manages to do that. I think it's harder in China. So I, I will just stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rolof. Professor San Jing Wei, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so Ken uh, said that she couldn't, he couldn't put uh, his uh, co-author's name on the uh, paper because of IMF uh, review process. So this reminds me that uh, about 18 years ago, uh, I was at the IMF, uh, Ken was my boss. Jeff Franco and I have a paper for economic policy. At the time I present the panel, uh, I was told, I may have told me that uh, I have to withdraw my name from the paper. The paper is called Assessing Chinese Exchange Rate. Part one of the paper looks at how China says it's, uh, assess its exchange rate, and we say that Chinese exchange rate is not what the government says. Part two of the paper looks at how the US Treasury assess Chinese exchange rate manipulation. And we said that uh, part of the Part of the determinants of U.S. assessment is domestic politics, not purely uh, economics. And my uh, IMF uh, colleague said, your paper has the unusual distinction of having the potential to simultaneously affect U.S. and Chinese authorities. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, uh, when, at the time the paper was published, my name was added to the paper. Okay, so I always enjoy reading uh, um, uh, Ken's uh, um, uh, uh, work, starting from when I was Ken, Ken's uh, teaching assistant uh, in graduate school. Okay, so um, in this, uh, so uh, you know, Ken gave a very broad uh, discussion about Chinese growth model. Uh, 
uh, we were given a, um, no, so uh, my other discussion and I were given a, a particular piece of paper. So, so unfortunately, I have to structure most of my discussion on a narrow piece of uh, uh, Ken's uh, uh, Ken's uh, uh, expensive uh, uh, comments. So, uh, in the uh, paper that uh, 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 Ken uh, 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 has given us, uh, it shows that the real estate and infrastructure uh, have directly, indirectly contributed to about 30 some percent of Chinese uh, GDP, large, uh, and uh, their scope for expansion has been uh, very likely uh, exhausted. You heard this from Ken uh, through multiple uh, dimensions. So here are a few proofs uh, that Ken uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, one, uh, the real estate and infrastructure shares of GDP have exceeded those of US, Japan, Korea, France, UK, Spain, uh, Germany, and, and Ireland. Very, uh, shares already very high. Uh, and as uh, strikingly, uh, per capita floor space has exceeded those of US, UK, France, and Japan, in spite of the fact China is a much poorer uh, country. I can also emphasize that uh, the problem seems to be more severe uh, in England uh, tier three uh, cities uh, than coastal cities or provincial uh, capitals. Uh, in uh, city uh, panel growth regressions, which Ken didn't mention in his remarks, but uh, in the paper, uh, they show, uh, you know, they have growth, regional growth on the left-hand side, uh, the interaction term between local housing uh, uh, stock uh, and uh, local uh, real estate investment to GDP share will have a negative sign, suggesting that additional uh, real estate uh, investment is uh, is unlikely to promote uh, GDP uh, growth uh, can goes uh, on uh, um, may, uh, give additional comments beyond the paper so that I don't really I didn't know uh, beforehand so I made some uh, 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 estimation uh, what can might have um, I might say so uh, for my comment I'm going to talk about a few things I'm going to um, uh, first, uh, you know, I uh, 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 provided uh, various quantity indicators about the real estate uh, and infrastructure uh, uh, sector. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask myself uh, what uh, prices and other indicators say about the same problem, number one. And number two, um, so one striking uh, data pattern uh, from uh, uh, Ken's uh, uh, remarks and presentation is that the Chinese are really into real estate investment, that they However poor they are, despite they, they, the fact they are very poor, they get they get to have uh, uh, you know as big a house as many high income countries uh, counterparts or even bigger. Why is that the case? And number three, uh, uh, if there's so if there's a re if we have an understanding of this, could that particular factor also play a role in Chinese growth? Uh, that make it uh, somewhat different from uh, the high income uh, country uh, comparison group. Uh, and, and finally, if the scope on roads and infrastructure have been exhausted, uh, can China for, find an alternative way to to uh, promote uh, growth? So on the, on the first one, um, so um, I just Google uh, uh, this uh, this morning about prices of a three bedroom apartment uh, in uh, Shanghai. There are a lot of real estate advertisement uh, for that. And the price right now for a three bedroom apartment, about 160 square meters or 1,400 or so square feet is about 1 million US dollars. Extremely, extremely high. Not quite the level of a central London, central, central Manhattan, but very, uh, I don't know about prices in Madrid, but it's, it's extremely, extremely high uh, pricing absolute value. Um, there are other uh, indicators people look uh, uh, use. Uh, 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 two principal ones are median home value to median household uh, in, uh, income ratio. And that's about somewhere between uh, for tier one, tier two cities, be somewhere between ten to uh, ten to uh, sixteen times of annual household income. Also, extremely high. Uh, that's uh, about the level uh, uh, of the U.S. before the global financial crisis. So, so that means uh, extremely, very, uh, extremely high. The price to rent ratio is also extremely uh, uh, high. So this means that uh, the large square footage per person uh, that we see in Chinese data is not because Houses are too cheap, or people are rich. You can easily rule the, uh, those things uh, out. So they make it sort of, so. So those uh, indicators uh, deepen uh, the puzzle that uh, um, uh, Ken uh, has uh, highlighted. Let's skip this. So what could uh, explain this? So um, in my comment too, I want to propose 
one uh, possible uh, explanation uh, that is marriage motivated uh, status competition might uh, help us to understand all three features of the real estate uh, market very high absolute price very high price relative to household income and very high housing price relative, relative to to uh, uh, rent so in, in terms of logic uh, if utility is increasing uh, not only in usual consumption in our model but also in being able to get married or having a sexual partner, that seems to be uh, reasonable. Uh, and if visible wealth, uh, including home ownership, enhances competition in the dating and marriage market, uh, then uh, uh, what could emerge from such models is that demand for owned home can reflect status competition uh, in the marriage market. And one of the, one of the drivers of uh, uh, chin changes in status competition uh, is the ratio of uh, uh, young young man, young woman in the marriage and dating uh, dating market and, and uh, a gender ratio in balance the dating marriage market happens to be a feature uh, in China that we don't see in the high income uh, uh, com country comparison group uh, in Ken's, uh, Ken's uh, um, uh, uh, presentation. So um, as, as a result, both housing prices, physical space, owned per family and home price to rent ratio can be higher uh, in, in places, regions uh, with uh, more fierce competition in the dating marriage, uh, uh, dating marriage uh, uh, market. So, so in this context, let me note that uh, owned property and, and rented properties are not functionally equivalent because you want to show uh, if wealth uh, is a way to, to in, enhance our competition in the dating marriage market. Being able to own the place uh, is very important. So being able to rent uh, does not serve the same uh, same function. Uh, the, uh, the, the second note is uh, this uh, forces what drives up all of all, all three housing market variables are uh, mostly by young men and parents with uh, unmarried uh, son. Uh, the third note is women uh, and family with a daughter do not have to offset those uh, faults. Uh, so one reason is that uh, with a rising, you know, with a rising, uh, I have a, I have a uh, graph from a model that shows why in, in equilibrium uh, uh, um, rising gender ratio uh, is enough to drive those things and uh, a relative shortage of women does not offset that. But the basic logic is, is that rising sex ratio means higher competition in the in dating marriage market, the need to compete to use visible uh, wealth, uh, such as own home, becomes uh, becomes higher. Uh, uh, shortage of women does not offset this, even though uh, it's easier for women to get uh, uh, married in a, in, a, in a society with fewer women than young men, than men, but no woman want to be just married to any random man. They want, you want to marry to as good men as possible, and they are still scarce. Uh, so, and women and parents with daughter may be worried about erosion with bargaining power within family, tournament affair, and, and, and spill and so on. That, that, that explains uh, uh, this. So this, um, I'm, I'm not going too quick on, on, on the logic, but let me give you some um, data. So as, as a, met, uh, as a, as a um, statement of, of, of data, in Spain, in most European countries, in the dating marriage market, ratio of young men to young women is very close to one to one. Shouldn't be surprising uh, to you. Uh, in China, the ratio uh, was very close to one to one 20, uh, 30 years, 40 years ago, becoming uh, uh, 1.15 uh, by uh, uh, 2010 and 1.18 now. So 1.15, 1.18 sounds very close to one, perhaps to some of you. Let me do some translation for you. At the ratio of 115 young men per 100 uh, young, uh, young women, one out of every eight young men cannot mathematically find a girlfriend or wife. That's what 1.15 means. At 1.18 would mean one out of every seven uh, couldn't find a, a, a girlfriend or wife. So I'm going to skip uh, why, what caused this. But um, so here's some uh, uh, evidence that sh uh, shows uh, that this prediction. So if you look, look at across, using household level data across regions, you see that a combination of having an unmarried son at home uh, and uh, uh, higher local young man to young woman ratio significantly predict, predicts a few things. One is how valuable a, a, a typical uh, a home uh, is, conditional family 
uh, family uh, wealth. So Antonio and I can have, can have comparable household income. If Antonio happened to be living, both of us have a son, unmarried son, if he happened to be living in a region with much higher gender ratio imbalance, meaning his son faces much tougher competition than me, you will see that uh, Antonio would uh, tend to own a more valuable home than, than me. The, the, the last four columns look at the physical space. You see the same thing is also true for uh, size of the home. So unit price per square meter goes up uh, and, and the physical uh, size of the place also uh, 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 goes up. Let me skip this graph. Uh, table. let me show you two, two graphs. So on this graph, uh, I, I describe for you um, uh, local sex ratio in the horizontal axis uh, and see how that is related to uh, home value to median household income. The, the picture on the left uh, compare rural towns to rural towns. The picture on the right compares cities with cities. In both samples, one, one, one see that a higher local uh, gender, ratio, uh, uh, gender ratio is a strong predictor of uh, median home uh, value to ho median household income ratio. The next paragraph, uh, same horizontal axis, the vertical axis now is a uh, home value to rent ratio, and you see the same uh, same uh, uh, pattern. And th this is uh, because uh, owned home is functionally much more important uh, than uh, 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 renting uh, renting home holding the size uh, uh, constant. So to summarize, one of the reason perhaps why the Chinese are so eager and so enthusiastic about uh, buying and owning expensive homes, in, despite of their much lower income than the, than the Spaniards, uh, is uh, is that because uh, the, you know the, the dating marriage market competition is so much higher, that greatly drives them to to look for ways to signal to uh, to, to to compete in the marriage uh, in, in marriage mar market, uh, uh, and therefore in that sense that the standard in international comparison by comparing China to other countries that don't have uh, the same kind of uh, uh, status competition and uh, need, uh, there may be a missing, a missing variable uh, there. The same logic, by the way, potentially apply to India, Vietnam, and a few other places uh, with a skewed uh, gender ratio. There are about a dozen or so countries in the world. Uh, they have very severe uh, gender ratio uh, imbalance in the, in the youth cohort. Lastly, uh, um, in terms of going forward, uh, the, why the Chinese uh, sex ratio at birth has, has been moderated, uh, but, the, uh, but the sex ratio for the dating and marriage uh, cohort continued to be getting worse. Its impact on real estate prices, square footage, are uh, still uh, uh, continue to be continuing to get uh, uh, worse. Uh, it takes probably another decade for the things to fully uh, uh, work out. Um, uh, this uh, same factor potentially have uh, a broader implication for many other uh, macro uh, variables, including savings rate, trade balance, under, uh, the, the seemingly undervalued real exchange rate, entrepreneurship growth, uh, industrial accidents. But uh, given the time constraint, let me just um, uh, give you a, a, big, uh, a bit more uh, detail on, on entrepreneurship and growth, since we talk about rethinking Chinese uh, uh, growth. So um, the, exact, the same logic that relative shortage of brides driving young men and parents with a, a young uh, unmarried son to try to find ways to improve uh, they, uh, uh, their or their uh, son's uh, uh, competitive position in the uh, marriage market. Also drive them, drive them to buy houses, lay savings, but also drive them to work harder. So here's a, a one, one of the three evidence we, we uh, look at. So on this, uh, the graph on the left, I show you um, local gender ratio, uh, young man to young woman ratio, um, uh, for the dating marriage uh, cohort across space, vertical access, I, I show you a measure of entrepreneurship, which is the growth rate of newly registered uh, private sector firms. So, so birth of you know, gross birth of firms uh, is a proxy for entrepreneurship. You see that data uh, shows a striking positive association between between the two. That is, regions with more skilled gender ratio. This is often controlling for local income, local economic structure. Uh, ge geography and so on, you find that region with more skilled generation, i.e. tougher competition in the data marriage market, tend to see much faster growth uh, of, uh, um, of uh, new uh, private sector uh, firms, uh, entrep uh, entrepreneurship and so on. So same thing you can uh, confirm in a, in a 
panel region growth, uh, GDP growth regression, you find that uh, uh, that uh, after controlling for standard growth uh, uh, determinants uh, based on the literature, you find that the local gender ratio imbalance is additional predictor of growth. And by our estimation of the last uh, 20, 30 uh, years, the, the high and rising uh, um, gender ratio imbalance roughly adds two percentage points to Chinese growth rate. So if Ch Chinese uh, GDP uh, growth was a seven percentage point uh, growth uh, story, that's pretty impressive. But the fact that it was growing uh, nine percent, and one, one important reason what the gender ratio does is to raise it from seven percent to to uh, nine uh, nine percent. A very quick comment number four. A very quick comment about uh, how did the uh, uh, rapid uh, infrastructure build up uh, uh, take place uh, that that uh, can also uh, uh, mention. So here is also something that's potentially uh, interesting. So uh, you know, between two thousand eight and twenty ten. Uh, the world has a few, huge shock, which is, um, uh, which is named as global financial shock, even though it was studied in one particular, uh, one or two particular uh, regions. Global financial, a uh, global financial price was a major negative demand shock to China, an ex extremely trade dependent uh, 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 economy. So you need to do something to, to uh, offset the, uh, that. Our, our macro model says you need to find something to offset the demand, uh, demand shock. In the U.S., President uh, Obama says the way we do deal with it is to find, is to work on shovel ready um, projects, um, but the Republican control Congress said no, you cannot do it. So you guys couldn't quite do this. Chinese Prime Minister had heard about this term shovel ready projects, so he asked his cabinet, "Do we have shovel ready projects?" At the time, China had much uh, underdeveloped infrastructure, not many uh, highways, not many uh, uh, there were no, close to zero high speed uh, trains, but there is part of government government have a plan. So we, they have a 15-year plan to build high-speed high rails, 30-year plan to build high highways. The, the prime minister says, can we do it in five years? That's your, your plan is the shovel-ready project. So that's the, that's, the, um, uh, uh, that's the origin of the Chinese uh, uh, infrastructure build up, uh, build up uh, today. And of course, those way of doing this uh, it clearly has a share of problems, including uh, various uh, inefficient projects, shadow banking, high local local government debt uh, that uh, can uh, mentioned. But it's equally useful to remember that uh, you know uh, during this uh, period, China was essentially the only large economy that had avoided uh, avoided a, a very severe uh, recession, partly because it moved to shovel ready projects uh, very quickly. Fast uh, forward to today now. There are far fewer shovel-ready projects here, so this is echoing uh, uh, Ken's uh, uh, thesis that if you, you know, housing stock is already high enough, infrastructure build-up is already high enough. Are you uh, and now China's facing a, a, a short-term growth challenge of low consumer investor com uh, confidence? You cannot quite do what you used to. Uh, you cannot uh, use uh, a housing market, real estate infrastructure to do this very quickly. Can you find effective alternative? Stimulus uh, tools. So that is uh, clearly an important uh, uh, ch uh, challenge. It's not, it's not uh, 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 obvious uh, what these things uh, uh, can be. If I have a bit more time, I would speculate on this, but if I uh, have run out of time, I'm going to just also comment on, uh, which I think uh, 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 Beko's uh, 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 Pence uh, thesis, they are also. Um, important, serious, medium-term and long, uh, longer-term uh, challenges, including less favorable uh, demographics, domestic politics, that's uh, often people talk about, that's the thing that the media here tends to focus on. So I want to also uh, expand it a bit on the external politics uh, part. So China is facing a um, smooth, hardy level tariff from one of its most important uh, trading market, U US. The tariff Chinese exports face in the U.S. about 22 percent. That's the smooth. That's the 1930s level tariff. So here's a country that faces a 1930s level tariff in its uh, large, one of the largest trading uh, markets. On top of it, it's it's, such a, it's uh, facing more adverse environment than a typical country in 1930s. That's because the other countries are also organizing um, important blockade of uh, technology in key parts and uh, in, uh, parts and components. So, the, so, so this is adding to adding to already a very long list of uh, uh, challenges the country is uh, uh, facing. So, uh, therefore, uh, one can be easily excused to feel 
very pessimistic about Chinese growth going uh, going forward. At the same time, we want to uh, we, we might want to remind ourselves this is not the first time that one feels pessimistic about uh, Chinese growth. I'm concluding with uh, with this. I counted at least four times in the past. In 1989, 1990, four Wall Street Journal for its uh, centennial celebration. Wall Street Journal was founded 100 years uh, prior. Wall Street Journal has a, a big spread on world economy, giving its forecast about future growth stars and future growth laggards. On its uh, list of future growth stars was Zimbabwe. Leading Wall Street Journal's predicted future growth disasters was China. So Wall Street Journal's and if China did, did turn out to be a growth disaster, we have so many reasons. Many people will say, I've told you so, because we think everything that was going on in China completely justified Wall Street Journal's extremely pessimistic uh, uh, forecast. In 2000, 2005, 2013, there were various US bestsellers that predicts, that predicts uh, 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 coming collapse of Chinese uh, economy. And so far has not happened. The question now going to uh, cite the uh, 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 Ken's book is this time different. Maybe I, maybe I end uh, here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for for very for, for all the insights that you gave us on, on on the housing market and on the challenge of the China's growth. Now is the the turn of Professor Kurt Kurt that uh, The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here to discuss this paper. It's a difficult act to follow. Uh, Ken and Sheng Jin, experts on China. I'm a bit of an outsider of the literature, so I think Sheng Jin gave you a very kind of micro perspective on the discussion. I'm going to give you a bit more of uh, maybe a macro kind of zoom out for people who aren't as familiar with the, the Chinese growth experience. So just to give you a sense of what I'm going to do in the short time I have, I'm going to give a brief overview of the paper, some specific comments on the paper that we were given, then kind of give you a sense of China's growth in, in context, kind of thinking about growth accounting from uh, a macro perspective. And then I kind of want to end with some thoughts on infrastructure, uh, since that was kind of the thing that kind of stuck with me the most after reading uh, their paper. Okay, so just a quick summary. I was saying, you know, China's had phenomenal growth kind of since the end of the, the Cultural Revolution. Uh, you know, about 30% of it has been attributable to construction and, and infrastructure, higher share than, than other advanced economies. You know, they provided some cross-sectional evidence of decreasing returns, in particular in the, the tier three cities. They're kind of raising concerns about local government debt uh, due to this reliance on uh, taxes from, from land. And, you know, I thought it was a very kind of thought-provoking paper with a lot of compelling facts that, you know, not being an expert on China made me then read several papers on Chinese growth. Uh, so uh, it was kind of a very interesting deep dive into to China. Some kind of very specific comments that actually Ken didn't get a chance to talk about. I mean, just on the instruments, um, IV1, you're kind of using a leave one out. Uh, I was wondering why you didn't use shift share design, something more like a Bartik. That seemed a little bit more natural to me. Um, the second IV, you know, you have fixed effects, but you're interacting things with a static share of developable land. And you know, what, what do you really need that um, or kind of what that's adding as opposed to just thinking about the variation coming from the uh, kind of growth forecasts. So those are kind of very in the weeds. Um, that I was something that I actually missed from the paper. Well, one thing in general, in terms of kind of thinking about what they have from the, the causal evidence on the decreasing returns is really how we should think about aggregation. I mean, this is something that, you know, I've done a lot of work where you try to learn something for the cross section to say something about the aggregate. And, you know, it's very difficult without a model to think about, you know, are there spillovers across regions? Are we picking up reallocation across different provinces? provinces? Uh, and you know, what may be decreasing returns kind of at the micro level doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be decreasing returns in the aggregate, right? We know kind of mm -hmm. basic examples where you could have Leontiev at the micro level that aggregates up into Cobb-Douglas. So how to think about how we can go from the cross-sectional regressions into aggregation, I think is something non-trivial, but it's, you know, the evidence there in the cross-section is compelling, but how to think about going from that to an aggregate number, I think some more work uh, would need to be done. Um, Ken already said this is not a problem. Um, it's kind of what I thought is that, you know, the central government would take care of the, the local government debt, but I guess it's something interesting still to, to look at. That's kind of specific comments. Now I want to kind of zoom out and think about China's growth in context. Uh, so here, now I'm going to be kind of relying on these papers that I read when, when preparing the discussion. Uh, so this is kind of comparing, in particular, China's growth uh, relative to kind of the, the Asian tigers, sometimes they're called Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. 
Uh, and this is kind of defining time as from when GDP per capita hit 3,000 US dollars uh, in some kind of chained uh, PPP terms. And you can see, so China here in red, the Asian tigers are kind of the black, green, and blue. You know, from that time, China doesn't look particularly remarkable compared to that experience. Uh, so, you know, for me, assuming that they can continue their growth trend doesn't seem particularly, you know, a priori unrealistic given what we've seen from uh, the other experience in, in Southeast Asia. Of course, there's a question uh, that is kind of brought up in the, the paper and has had some discussion is, you know, as part of the development also requires structural change. Uh, and so this is again a paper from, a figure from this paper by Sasaki et al. Uh, to the, the right of the black line is projection, so we can focus just on the left. It does look like, at least in principle, China is undergoing uh, structural change, like we've seen in, in other economies along their, their growth paths, where the share of uh, employment in agriculture is falling, uh, the share of employment in manufacturing industry rose, now you know, it's coming down from its peak, and the, the share of employment in, in services is rising. Um, you know, the share of employment in agriculture is still high, kind of relative to other countries at uh, a similar growth experience. But you know, if we think about the, the trends, it looks like China is you know, in the process of kind of switching uh, toward a more service-based uh, economy. Question of, kind of how, how much can it sustain it? Uh, but it seems, you know, in principle, to be on kind of the, stand, the standard uh, structural trends growth path. This is kind of, again, showing, you know, relative to when you reach your peak in manufacturing employment, uh, relative to other advanced economies, you know, China seems to be uh, following a similar, you know, growth trend in terms of the, the employment share. Okay, so the kind of the first facts that for me looking at China is that China looks kind of like the Asian tigers. Uh, but there's a question, you know, still, there's a big debate in the literature about what caused their rapid growth. Uh, you know, there's some papers that kind of attributed to different factors. So I thought about here just kind of how do we teach kind of grad students in, in macro uh, to think about growth accounting. And so if we think about going back to solo, we can think about, to, you know, accounting for growth in output into kind of three measures, you know, TFP, capital uh, and, and labor. Of course, you know, you could then decompose this and you get the, the standard solo residual where the, the growth rate of output is just going to be the growth rate of TFP, which is kind of the, the residual plus the, the capital share times the growth rate in capital and the, the labor share times the, the growth rate in labor. Now, if we have constant returns of scale, perfect competition, and we can measure inputs, then we can do this accounting. Now, these are a lot of ifs, uh, you know, perfect competition. I mean, measuring inputs, K, you know, K has to be constructed. L is not just bodies. It's kind of effective units of labor. Uh, so these are difficult things to do, uh, but people have done them. And so I'm going to show you kind of what uh, what you do if you do this type of growth accounting exercise where you try to you know, account for capital and, and labor carefully. Um, and so this is by uh, a World Bank or IMF a working paper by Brandt et al. So this is kind of decomposing output per worker in China, kind of going from 79 to 2018, that's kind of the, the leftmost plot, uh, into the contribution from TFP, physical capital per worker, and human capital per worker. So, you know, those three kind of three terms that uh, I showed you before, so you can see kind of over that that time period, you know, the the majority was due to physical capital per worker, but TFP still had a significant uh, share of growth. Now the next four bars kind of show breakdown by by decades or by nine year periods, uh, and you can start to see here some of what you know kind of the the thesis of uh, of Ken's paper was was that really in over, you know starting in 1999 and even more pronounced after 2009, you can see that a big part of the, the growth accounting in output per worker is driven by physical capital per worker. So it's really coming from capital deepening and not from uh, human capital kind of increasing or from, from TFP increasing. So that this is kind of the question of how, how far can this be sustained? This is going to just show you, though, you know, in the context of how far can it be sustained. So this is going to be looking at, again, from the, the same Brandt et al. paper, kind of government capital per worker and private capital per worker, uh, kind of showing you that the dots are cross-section, uh, the orange dots are OECD countries. The red kind of shows you the growth path of China. Uh, so you can see in terms of on the right panel, the private capital per worker, China doesn't look like it has you know too high of a capital stock uh, per worker relative to where it is in, in terms of growth. If anything, it's kind of on the, the low end. 
on the government side, it does seem to be at the, the higher end. So it could be that on, on government capital, it's reaching more uh, of, of diminishing returns. But it still looks like there is kind of potential for further capital deepening uh, with, within China. Again, here, here are some pictures uh, from you know, another World Bank report from, from HERD. This is kind of looking at you know, capital output ratios, kind of both for infrastructure and, and government and for housing, comparing the US to China. Uh, they look kind of relatively stable over these time periods, but you can see, again, these data series end in 2016. Uh, China is the orange line in both figures. Uh, that in terms of, for, for sure, in infrastructure, you see this ex acceleration toward the end where it starts to uh, pass what we have in, in the US. Uh, and also housing, again, starts to cross uh, what the, the US line is. So again, this is kind of more suggestive evidence that perhaps the, the capital to output ratios are kind of getting above what uh, where we're getting into to decreasing returns. In terms of, again, TFP and human capital, if you can look at kind of relative to the frontier, China still has a lot of scope for potential catch up in TFP. So, you know, TFP is still relatively low, kind of both relative to frontier and also relative to other countries uh, with similar, similar, similar levels of GDP per capita. Uh, they're doing a little bit better in terms of human capital, but again, that's still uh, a bit lower. So, you know, in principle, there is still room for China to have catch up in terms of TFP. Uh, I think the question is, you know, how can they, they make that happen? Um, and I think that it seems like they're aware that this is a problem. Um, again, this is looking at uh, Chinese R&D investment. Uh, kind of as a share of GDP and in, in nominal terms on the left, you can see, you know, as a share of GDP, it's kind of increased from, you know, it doubled basically since uh, 2001. Uh, so now it's kind of on par with the EU27, but still it's kind of much lower than uh, the, the Asian tigers, so South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, and, and lower the United States. So it seems like there is still scope for another type of investment, which perhaps could help uh, kind of sustain Chinese growth that, that we've seen so far. So just to kind of summarize, I mean, I think like my stylized facts on China is that, you know, there had been a combination of TFP, capital deepening, and improved human capital. Since 2009, there's been little TFP growth, most, mostly capital deepening. Uh, but TFP is still far from the frontier, so there's room for catch up. And, you know, the pattern so far has been similar to the, the other Asian tigers, uh, so that there is potential for scope to continue at the, the same growth rate. Um, Though you know these capital output ratios have converged, you know to, to U.S. levels, so maybe there's less role for capital deepening going forward. One thing that I mean, I thought kind of very interesting to think about from from reading their paper is the role of infrastructure in growth. I mean, in, in most growth accounting, it just kind of gets put into uh, the capital stock. But I think you know there's some theoretical work by by Ken's uh, colleague Robert Barrow, but you know. Infrastructure can be have complementaries with capital and labor. There can be network effects, increasing returns to scale. It can increase market access, reduce transaction costs. So I, I think that, you know, to me, one of the interesting things that I would think going forward uh, from reading this paper and just thinking about China in general is thinking kind of quantitatively, what is the role of infrastructure in growth? Uh, and, you know, how maybe can we use the Chinese experience to learn more about this kind of at a, a more fundamental level? Finally, you know, there's been some talk of, of high-speed rail. Um, you know, it's not clear that we want to compare the U.S. as the frontier for infrastructure. Um, you know, to get from New York to Boston is not very fast and not very pleasant. Um, but, you know, in, in general, I think that, you know, a lot of the U.S. and also in Europe, it's not clear that the, the level of infrastructure investment to GDP is kind of what the right target is. Uh, and maybe, you know, China is closer to something kind of optimal from a, a social planning perspective. So just to wrap up, uh, like I said, I think it was a very provocative paper. Uh, it made me think a lot and you know, want to learn a lot more about kind of what's been going on in, uh, in China and, and growth. And I think it's, it's going to spur a lot of follow-up research. Um, you know, there's a question of kind of what's behind the slowdown in Chinese TFP growth. It seems you know, clear that they're using real estate to try to, or capital deepening to fill that gap. Uh, but the question is kind of why. Um, you know, now we'll kind of, there's a lot of issues with technology transfer and technology adoption that, you know, you could think that TFP growth is going to be slower because of that. Uh, so, you know, how, what's the government going to do uh, and how can we learn more about infrastructure and, and growth? Thank you very much. Uh, well, those were two fantastic discussions and uh, thanks to both Kurt and Shang Zhen. They're just great discussions <clears throat> and uh, a lot of food for thought. Um, 
just a couple comments. Let me first start with uh, uh, Shang Zhen. Um, there, as far as I understand it, there's actually been a decline in the rate of Chinese women getting married uh, in recent years. That's been a striking demographic change. The birth rate in China, despite ha uh, you know getting rid of the one-child policy, has actually gone down. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems facing uh, tier three cities is uh, part of it is there's you know they have housing, they have eighty percent of the physical housing stock. And if you're going to have a family, it's great. But if you're not, and so a lot, a lot of people are leaving tier three cities and the tier three cities are already losing population. Um, and so it's, uh, um, you know, uh, I'd also say the merit, the marriage issue, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, you're saying that it's become exacerbated. Um, I think a lot of things in China, if you look at data from 12 years ago, it changes very, very fast. So actually what we find, so we've done a lot of further empirical work that we were given a very short page limit for what was attended. I was invited to give a broad talk on China. In fact, I will say, sorry to say this, but I will say it, that I sent the paper, I submitted the paper, a much longer version, and the editor said, well, I don't know how housing, you know, really has broad enough effects. Sorry, say that. So why don't you give a talk on the broader, you know, things? And I, I think, in fact, the last six or eight months has shown that housing has really broad effects in China. And so a, 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 ling a lingering uh, thing. And uh, it is concentrated in, the, in these uh, tier three cities. Um, uh, you made a lot of good comments, Kurt. We did look at a lot of further things about both the growth and the real estate. There are a lot of other regressions and the accompanying uh, and the other related uh, related paper we did. You said something about the size of tier three cities. It's sixty percent, even of the investment in uh, in. Uh, uh, it's 80% of the physical housing stock because it's much more expensive to do real estate investment in the richer cities. The labor's more expensive. And uh, just coming more to Kurt's comments, uh, you mentioned Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. You know, that's going to be great. You know, if they do like Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, very, very few countries have managed to do that. And uh, there's a lot of other countries uh, one could compare to. And, uh, you know, we can, you know, I, I, it, the work, the papers we presented just talk about real estate and infrastructure, but obviously there's other stuff going on. You both mentioned it in your comments about, uh, the, the centralization of power, how do you, uh, tech has been a huge part of growth and how do you have growth in the tech sector when you, nationalize it, uh, which to some extent they've done. Uh, and uh, a final comment on infrastructure, and I don't know that literature super well, uh, but I, I mean, an example of a recent paper is Peter Henry has a paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, forthcoming, it's already published, uh, where they, he sort of does a review of the literature. His assessment of the literature, and you know, he's looking at infrastructure in Africa, but he's assessing the literature about the rich countries is that the, the more recent literature gives it a much smaller weight. There was this work by, I think it was David Ashour in the JME, I want to pick 1991, but I don't know exactly when it was, that was often used uh, to say infrastructure, if you put it into a growth model, it's magic and gives a big return. Uh, but actually that's come way down. And I think uh, he cites uh, uh, a paper by uh, John Fennold um, and, uh, uh, his assessment is that that was all wrong. The, the United States in particular, the highway system and some of the infrastructure done was in the 1990, uh, done in the 1950s and 60s was a one-time thing. There's just no magic in infrastructure anymore. And I, I again, you know, it's that there's a debate, at, at the very least a debate in the literature about uh, gains from infrastructure. Um, uh, so, Anyway, a lot of food for thought, and thank you for the comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there is any, any question from the audience. 
<laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, fascinating talks, of course, and, and from the three of you. Um, and, and, you know, by the way, anyway, I joined the fund 11 years ago, the Asia department, actually. And, and, you know, even in my first week, there was an internal debate as to whether this was it. China was going right, to drop like a stone. And, you know, the team saying, no, you know, this time is different. And it's been right, 11 years uh, with this time is different, basically. So, so the, to speak to the, this time is different, you know, I think one reason also, one, one argument for why China might be different including with respect to housing, right, and real estate that has been made is the fact that uh, you may not have in the case of a housing crash, real estate crash in China, the same kind of amplifying mechanisms you've seen in a lot of other housing crashes, in particular, for example, feedback loops between, you know, bank balance sheet, bank credit supply and household corporate balance sheets and the like, right? Uh, and, and one reason why, it's, you know, the, the sanguine view to, tends to, to hold that China would be different is that the government could intervene. It's a common and control economy if needed. Government could step in, recapitalize the banks, you know, mandate them to keep uh, lending and, and such things, which is why, you know, even those who have been really concerned about a, a potential you know, housing crash in China have been saying, look, even in that case, though conditional on that crash, you may not have such a big macro effect, uh, uh, you know, at least smaller than what you've seen in, in uh, advanced economies in the past. So, you know, wanted to get your sense of whether you What's your view on that view, basically? Thanks a lot. Okay. Is there any other question? Thank you. Very, very nice discussion. I have two comments. First uh, is um, actually comes from a comment by Kurt, uh, saying that there is uh, China is still very beyond um, below the possibility frontier. And uh, I wonder, and you quote the example of Korea and Japan, where the, the boosting growth was given by TFP. Uh, now, the commercial wars going on with the, with the US, is it hurting a lot of this TFP-led growth? Because Japan and Korea have the benefit of having a very benign international climate and transfer of technology and so now it's not there for china how much this is important or not second comment is about the how to say the peacock theory of uh, housing um, where peacocks show big tails to attract female peacocks and uh, they compete in the in the size of the of the tail and uh, uh, why housing and not education, for instance? Would you, uh, instead of competing by both, but uh, a policy for government would be in addition to a rate with the male female uh, male ratio, just to convince that uh, education is more important than the housing. I don't know. It's, it seems more productive also because this would help uh, with the TFP growth. Thank you. There is another question. Uh, yeah, great paper. Uh, so, so clearly, I mean, the, 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 the argument yeah. is based on the interaction between decreasing returns and, and the fact that China has this very large stock of, uh, of housing, uh, housing. And I would be interested to see, so, so you give some estimate of these decreasing returns in China across, across region. That's the regression two in your table two. Um, is there a way to compare this coefficient with, um, with some other countries or across countries, to what extent the decreasing returns are as strong in China as in uh, as in other uh, countries or across countries? Uh, because in some sense, coming back to to changing uh, uh, comment, uh, um, yes, maybe the steady state stock of uh, cap of housing uh, capital in, in China is different, maybe for you know these preference uh, issues, but it's a bit like conditional convergence. Uh, 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 literature at some point anyway the, the decreasing returns are going to come with a vengeance and 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 will have an impact on growth but uh, you know it would be interesting to understand you know what is the, the beta coefficient in some sense here for for the stock of capital and to what extent it's uh, it's it's, uh, it's the same in china and and different and in different in, in other countries and then the second comment is in a sense, you're okay. So you're pessimistic about uh, Chinese growth. That's that's the point, and because of your story. 
But then we'd like to understand to what extent quantitatively this is going to matter a lot uh, for Chinese growth in the future. So here, here the stock of the, the, the argument rests on the fact that the stock of capital housing uh, capital in China is very large. Is there a way that you can tell us, you know, using your coefficient? And here, obviously, Kurt is going to come with uh, the, the being concerned. You know, and be careful when you are using these cross-sectional uh, regressions to, for the aggregate. But is there a way to tell us? Okay, so 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 you have this coefficient uh, of growth depending on on, on the investment in uh, in housing. If we take seriously your estimates, and I do, of course. Uh, you know, what's the next step? What is, you could make a computation of what is going to be the gross, the, sh the uh, negative growth shock uh, on Chinese growth due to your story. And it'd be difficult, but I guess at least an estimate of saying, you know, in the 10 next years, uh, what is going to be the impact of the existing uh, stock of capital on the growth rate of investment in, or on the investment in uh, housing? And you've shown that this is important for the growth rate of GDP. So you should be able to tell us something very maybe impressionistic, but still something on what's going to happen on growth in China based on your story. Um, well, let me start by saying I. I don't think we can answer your questions, Philippe. I mean, it's really, it would be easier with an aggregate, mod, just like a, a simple aggregate model to be doing a calculation like that and to translate, uh, you know, our, our cross city comparisons into a, a growth number, I think, it's just way beyond the scope of, uh, you know, what I see how to do, but we can uh, we can talk about that, that further. Um, so uh, coming back to the peacock theory, uh, which was important, but a lot of the, the problem is in tier three cities. The jobs have not come to the tier three cities. The high incomes have not come to the tier three cities. So if you're your peacock settling in your house in the tier three cities, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's good for some, but it's not. That's really where the problem is, that they build it and no one came and not enough people came. And uh, that's that they've had this uh, encourage the system. And it, I, I said I couldn't second guess the logic, but it's not working out. It's not an aggregate thing. It's it uh, it's very much in the in the tier three cities. Um, so uh, China has slowed a lot. And we don't even know what the numbers are. Let's be honest here. I mean, so the the it, you know even from the official numbers, it has slowed since you came in 2011. The slowdown's really been quite dramatic. The question, you know, is exactly uh, how much it is. And when we wrote our first paper, we actually tried to do some back of the envelope calculation, like Philippe said about the aggregate number, but we didn't have a dynamic model. We were basing it on this input-output calculation without a dynamic model, and it was a long step to connecting it. And so we, we gave a number. I won't even say what it was. Um, but we tried to say it would be significant without a feedback loop because of the construction so big. But that doesn't mean that there won't be a feedback loop because, yes, the state can step in, but... Uh, you said just order them to keep doing credit. Credit for what? I mean, there's a question of how do you allocate in a command and control situation with 1.4 billion people. In fact, uh, a lot of the comparisons people want to make to China or you know, to some very small country by comparison, which mostly use market mechanisms of allocation except for infrastructure. So if you're going to if you're going to go to something where China's going to use the state-controlled banks to create growth, forget it. I mean, they have not created growth. The growth, actually, a lot of the the, the, the growth financings come from elsewhere. And uh, if if we think of reason, we can think of reason. Of course, China can do great. I mean, it's got very talented people and it's accomplished a lot. There's no question about that. But is that a realistic expectation given their institutions? Uh, are we seeing signs that, you know, they're running into uh, problems with 
They're centralized government, like the Soviet Union, is very good at building stuff. They're great at that. That has been China's answer to every contraction, is building more stuff. And, you know, you run into diminishing returns. Education, yes, uh, that's still very weak, you know, by comparison. And, and there are questions, why don't, why don't they just do transfers? People don't want to consume. Why doesn't the central government do transfers? Why don't they let the... Uh, local governments do property taxes. I don't know the answers to those things. There are solutions. I, I mentioned that property taxes, Kei Ujian talks about this in her book, that there was a tremendous tr trouble with uh, corruption. And uh, you know, I come from Boston. Boston actually used to have quite a corruption problem when I was in graduate school, uh, believe it or not. And I can imagine in a country of 1.4 billion people, uh, it's very hard to control. So the you know these things are not uh, are not easy. And lastly, on the comparison to rich countries, that if we compare again, going back to what the Asian Development Bank did, if we compare China, there are developing economies that have spurts of this, but China's done it way longer than anybody else has. Anyway, thank you. If anyone has a, a question, I have one one question that is very much related to, to your presentation and also the the court one. No? And then part of them is also in this in these uh, final thoughts. Uh, the idea is, uh, you know, from the growth accounting, you know, some of the factors that are behind they are relatively worrisome. No, you, demographics, I think, is not going to foster potential growth. Investment with your paper is clear that also we, we should expect at least diminishing returns. And then the, the real strategy to grow is through foster innovation or to adopt new, new, new technologies. But we are in an environment that with the new geopolitics, uh, protectionists, this is going to be increasingly difficult. Then I, I don't know if at the end we should expect that China will fail in the middle income trap, no? and then we cannot reach the levels of development required to be an advanced economy. So that's very, it's very much related to one of the charts that you that you show us. Yeah, can I just say, I, I wanted to be clear, I don't, I'm not saying that China is going to be like Japan and Korea, it was more of a just, you know, in the context, how does it look? Um, but I think that you bring up, you know, a lot of good points, I mean, the role of institutions, I mean, U.S. and Argentina were on the same growth path at one point, and we see where they are today. So, I mean, I think that, you know, there are a lot of challenges um, and was kind of thinking about, you know, how, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of potential investment in business kind of capital that the government, maybe through their banks, could do. Um, of course, like how, if they don't know who to lend to or where kind of MPK is high, it's not clear that that's uh Way to go. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I would say that my conclusion is also skeptical that they can continue the rate of growth. It wasn't meant to say that they would kind of keep going on. Uh, I guess the, what would be interesting to know is why TFP growth fell. Because um, to me, it seems like TFP growth fell, and so they filled the gap with real estate. Um, like it seems to be what you said, when they have a problem, they filled the gap. And so. I mean, just one final thought on that. If you look at uh, Latin America, a lot of Asia, Central Europe, it's a very common pattern that there's, you know, big growth from infrastructure and building stuff, and then it starts slowing down. And in those places, they often have a financial crisis because it's slowing down. What do you do when it's slowing down? You start having very credit intensive growth as China has and you have a financial crisis, maybe they won't. I mean, I'm certainly not saying they will. But uh, in my book with Carmen, we actually mostly talk about what we call um, type two financial crises. But we also have a discussion, it's not nearly as extensive, of type one of these more controlled economies that's still not very pretty when uh, you, know, you run to the end of the line on credit expansion. <laughs> Can I also add two two comments? So on tier three uh, city uh, uh, cancel, there's a recent paper by uh, Gordon Hansen and co-author. They should so the, so the New York Times uh, report of the paper uses the title: "Is Vietnam and India replacing China?" And the, and and they cited their papers. So what the paper says actually, there's a lot of uh, uh, export growth from inland tier three cities that 
you know, coastal China is not doing well because the export was oriented towards the uh, U.S. Tier, uh, tier three cities in the inland were growing faster than either Indian or, or uh, um, uh, uh, Vietnam. These are the places who, whose incomes are much lower than the, than the coastal uh, areas. There's still continued scope for, for growth from their source. So that's uh, one comment. The other comment is about TFP growth. So the, so the, of the previous 40 some years, the source of TFP growth, what is TFP growth? In the Chinese context, it's, it's, it's about elimination of inefficient policies, precisely because the starting point of the Chinese economy was like a Soviet style, North Korean style uh, economy. Gradual deviation from that is what uh, the principal source of TFP growth. Today, uh, there continue to be sources of this. So, so the, one of the reasons, uh, I think uh, Ken mentioned about, did, did you mention SIF law? That's because city size distribution uh, of, of Chinese uh, cities uh, deviates from uh, SIF law because Chinese government has very strict controls about growth of a very large city. So large cities in China are undersized uh, due to uh, control. So removal of those uh, policies uh, can improve on uh, efficiency. That's a source of TIP uh, growth. I mean, those comments do not distract from the you know the main thesis of uh, of uh, of Ken, but, you know, in terms of trying to imagine whether there is additional source of TFP growth, the, the answer is they are still uh, growth. This is not I mean command command and control uh, economy is a very uh, relatively slick label, but 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 you know the balance of this in China is not North Korea economy. China, if you compare China with India, for example, I have a country also did a lot with interest. China is no less market oriented than India in many, many dimensions. You, you've been to India too, right? So you, you... <laughs> Those are all good points. I will say if you go back to the 1980s, there was a lot of, you could have heard a discussion like that about Brazil, about a whole bunch of other countries that never went anywhere. I mean, there is a middle income trap. It's difficult to escape. And, uh, you know, China is very aware of it, but so are they, you know, at the time. Yep. Uh, has a question? Yes, yes, one question. Mm. Professor Rogo, I, I, I saw the, the first part of your intervention. I, I was amazed. I, I thought you were speaking about Spain. <laughs> uh, then I realized, no, you were talking about China. But no, yeah. In 2005, I was speaking about Spain. <laughs> no, but, but then, then I thought, well, uh, if he's speaking about Spain, why he's not talking about the labor market and unemployment, the youth unemployment rate? And uh, well, you, you haven't talked about this in, in, in the presentation. So I wonder, what do you think about that? And then... Well, I don't want to be the one that seems optimistic about about the developments, future developments in China. And you you seem to be suggesting, look, uh, growth in China has come through investment in infrastructure, housing, and infrastructure. There is nothing that can uh, compensate for this drop and this decrease in returns. But again, perhaps I I miss it. But what about the digital transition? What about the ecological transition? We know that this is going to entail massive amounts of investment in in, in Europe, in 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 the US. This could perfectly replace the, the growth support that that housing and infrastructure is giving in China, and, and actually, and perhaps I'm wrong, but but we we tend to say in some in some sectors that China has a competitive advantage versus uh, the, the US versus Europe in in this digital transition, in this ecological transition. So again, I I, I miss this this part of the discussion to to be more uh, perhaps unnecessary, but more optimistic on the growth future of China. Um. Thank you for those comments. Um, the youth unemployment is a great point. Uh, they've actually stopped publishing it in China because it's so bad. Um, and there's a generational problem that I think other Asian economies have experienced where even though there are these incentives to work hard, they don't. And uh, you know how do you, how do, they've gotten a lot richer at the long coastal China. They're quite well off by international standards. They don't want to work as hard. They don't want to live the same way. They don't want to work in a factory uh, like their parents did. And, uh, you know, other, other countries have faced that problem. And uh, China has a, a severe problem. And all the more so if there are a lot of young men who, you know, uh, know that it's very difficult to find a partner. On the digital transition, so yes, I would have said that five years ago, but uh, the and they may change, but the crackdown that they've done on the tech sector is really quite astounding. Uh, and 
it's very hard to com you can compete with the United States on certain things by just being big, having the most data, building the biggest uh, databases. But there is continual innovation, and I don't see how you have continual innovation on their current scheme. I I once asked a tech guru from uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, aren't you worried that the Chinese are going to get quantum computing before we do? And what are we going to do? And he said, well, the only way they're going to get quantum computing before us is if they steal it. And uh, he was making a remark about their ecosystem for having, uh, you know, for having innovation and digitization. So uh, that remains to be seen. Well, I may prove wrong, in which case we're in trouble, uh, I would say because it's rele very relevant for military power also. I think that there is an online question. I don't know if you would like to, to ask directly or we will, we will read your, your question in the chat. Uh, is this being directed to me about demography? <laughs> Hello? I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, right. No, I mean, I. My, my name is Bernard Casey from London and Frankfurt. I had a question about the impact of demography on China's progress. I was fascinated by the discussion about the unbalanced sex ratios and its impact upon um, house uh values and house prices is this is something i hadn't thought about i might point out that in east germany there is also a major sex imbalance partly because all the bright younger women went off to west germany and the not very bright younger men stayed in the east and that actually might explain some of the political problems which one sees there and that raises problems for china too but my point was that China, what was behind a lot of this argument was that China's um, birth rate dropped dramatically and associated with that was a change in the sex ratio of surviving children for whatever reason. But that fall in the birth rate seems to be driven by something other and things like the one child policy, which got mentioned again, simply because one has seen that in quite a lot of rather similar countries to China, where there was no one child policy. If the problem is the change in the number of births and the dramatic fall in the fertility rate, something else which has been removed from the Chinese statistics and before even the youth unemployment statistic was removed, if there has been this major fall in birth rates, which has been caused by something and we don't know what it was, this seems to have a very profound impact on China. We were promised something about demography and I'd just like to hear a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Well, you know, first, Charles Goodhart and Pradhan have a book where they really emphasize demography in China. And uh, it's clearly going to have a much smaller population. The labor force part is just starting to hit. Uh, it gets very big 10 years from now. And, uh, you know, we've seen that in other countries. It's extremely problematic. So they had that sort of uh, uh, a cannon facing them, you know, as they go forward, no question. It has been surprising that when they removed the one child policy, it didn't they they should have they just made it two children that was silly but they did um but when they removed the one child policy it wouldn't have had a more dramatic effect now part of that is the one child policy actually didn't hold for everybody the same uh it held if you uh, were a government worker if uh, you worked in a state enterprise and certain jobs it uh, held more in the biggest cities it was much less true in the smaller cities and but there there's just been a general dramatic birth decline throughout Asia. Look at Korea, uh, look at Japan, and and where, and Taiwan. Yes, yeah. I mean everywhere in Asia. Uh, it's also true in Germany and you know Italy and uh, most countries in the world. So China is definitely you know not 
you know, experiencing that. And uh, but yeah, there's a lot to be said about demography, but we, you know, couldn't cover everything. If there is no more more question, I think it's the the moment to to end the, the session. I, I would like to, to to thank very much Professor Rogoff and also the two panelists, Sinjin Wei and and Kirk uh, Mitman, for for the very interesting remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs>